everyone, and welcome to the Fresh Air Campus webinar on implementing a smoker and tobacco-free campus policy. I am Molly Reese, ORI's Fellow with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Region 10 office. And before we get started, I just have a couple of housekeeping items. Um, everybody calling in on the phone has been placed in silent mode just to cut back on some of the background noise. But if you should have questions throughout the webinar, please use the chat feature and type your question into the box that can be found at the lower left-hand side of your screen. We'll go ahead, and go ahead and save all of the questions until the very end of the webinar, and then we'll go ahead and answer, answer them all. So before I hand it over to our first presenter, I just want to share a little bit of information about our Fresh Air Campus Challenge. Um, the challenge is a collaboration among the tobacco prevention partners in Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, the HHS Region 10 office, and our local partners. The challenge is a first of its kind region-wide initiative that encourages universities, community, vocational, and technical colleges to go 100% smoke or tobacco free. So in the short term, our goal is to have all campuses of higher education in our four state region sign on to the challenge and take meaningful steps towards smoke or tobacco free policy. We really want all campuses to at least start the conversation and explore what a tobacco free campus policy may look like on your campus. Ultimately, our goal is to have all campuses in Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington be 100% smoke or tobacco free by 2016. We're proud to have 25 campuses um, across the Pacific Northwest formally signed on to the challenge. To date, we have 14 campuses that are signed on as silver or bronze fresh air campuses, which means that these campuses are actively working towards a smoke or tobacco free campus policy. Additionally, we have 11 campuses who have already implemented a policy who have committed to serving as mentors. Since our last webinar, we've welcomed Columbia Basin College and Clark College to the challenge. Uh, and a big thank you and congratulations to all of our Fresh Air campuses for your efforts in protecting the health and safety of your students, staff, faculty, and visitors. So the Fresh Air Campus Challenge offers a variety of resources for both campus advocates and public health professionals. We have a wonderful website, and our website has recently moved. The new, the new URL is listed here. Um, the National Tobacco-Free College Campus Initiative is now hosting our webpage. And the TFCCI is a great resource for all things tobacco-free college related. So I encourage you all to take some time to explore that website. Um, you'll find the latest research, toolkits, sample policies, and guides to help you in your tobacco-free campus policy initiative. We also host quarterly Fresh Air Campus webinars, uh, and all of our previous webinars, which are listed here, are recorded and can be accessed through our website along with the slide deck. Technical assistance is also available for Fresh Air advocates. Whether you are just starting the conversation on campus or interested in starting conversation or are somewhere along, uh, longer in the process and you need some additional support or resources or recommendations, please get in touch with me and I can work to connect you with a local tobacco prevention and control expert and together we can make sure that you have the information and resources to support your efforts. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Stephanie Young-Peterson. And Stephanie is a public health professional with 15 years experience working in the field of tobacco control. While working at Lane County, Oregon Public Health Division, Stephanie successfully led over a dozen local health, health policy initiatives designed to reduce illness and death caused by tobacco products. Policies passed and implemented include the City of Eugene Smoke-Free Workplace and Tobacco Retail License Laws, smoke-free public housing rules, tobacco-free hospital and behavioral health treatment facilities, tobacco-free city and county property policies, tobacco-free K-12 through and college and university campuses. In her role with local public health authorities, Stephanie assisted the University of Oregon staff and students with their advocacy efforts to pass a comprehensive tobacco-free campus policy. She was later served as co-chair to the U of O Smoke and Tobacco-Free Implementation Team. Stephanie is currently a senior consultant for the Reed Group, a health policy consulting firm located in Portland, Oregon. So with that, I'll hand it over to Stephanie. Stephanie, go ahead and press star six to unmute your line. Thank you, Molly. Can you hear me? 
going to assume that everybody can hear me. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, my name is Stephanie Young-Peterson. I am with the Reed Group. And I am going to share with you um, very briefly today um, the implementation story with regards to the University of Oregon Smoke and Tobacco-Free Campus. Um, today I'm going to cover really quickly um, our policy history at the University of Oregon with regards to tobacco, um, talk a little bit more in depth about what our implementation team looked like. Um, most people usually have questions with regards to what does this really cost to implement. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but I'll spend more of the time um, speaking to the marketing and education efforts that led up to the policy being implemented as well as um, enforcement because that seems to be <clears throat> what a lot of people really want to learn about these days. Um, and then I'll close briefly with some lessons learned. So uh, I just wanted to let folks know that Although I'm talking about implementation today, this was a really, really long process that led up to um, the point where we could implement a policy. The U of O had been working on tobacco control policy for at least 10 years before um, the student advocates and the staff at the Student Health Center were able to um, simultaneously convince the student um, government president and the University of Oregon president that this was a good thing to move forward with. Um, our process was different than what I think most other campuses are doing right now in the way that um, we pushed for an announcement from the president that there was an, an intent to eventually implement a policy. Um, and we, we pushed for that before we actually had a written policy in hand, um, which there were some benefits and drawbacks to that. I'll talk about that briefly here in a minute. Um, so the implementation team was actually formed after the president um, made the official announcement that this is what we're moving towards. Um, and the policy development piece, the actual language in the rules, was um, uh, it was one of the charges of the implementation team to actually come up with what that policy looked like and then get it vetted through the administration. Um, and then the uh, policy did have to go to a, a public hearing because it was going to apply to more than just the staff, faculty, and students. It would apply to anybody who came onto campus. So that actually had to become a state law, and there was a process with that. So this is President Riviera's announcement on the Great American Smokeout of 2010. Um, and again, after many years of advocacy work, he announced it's a great time to be a duck, and it's even better to be a tobacco-free duck. I'm proud that we're the first in the Pac-10 to do this. Now we're the Pac-12. Back then it was Pac-10. Um, he said, I applaud Amelie. She was our student body president and our students for their leadership. And I want to thank everyone who helped make this a reality. We're sending a powerful message today that when you come on this campus, you join a community committed to mind and body. You've now heard it from me. The University of Oregon will be tobacco free. But you'll notice how there was no drop dead date there. So we had to scramble and, and work to convince um, the, the powers that be that you know, we wanted to implement this by fall 2012. Um, there was a bit of a lag period from when he made the announcement in the fall of 2010 to when the implementation team actually got pulled together. It took a good five months probably to get the right people in the room and get, have them invited by the um, Vice President of Student Affairs. But when that eventually did happen and she sent the letter out, um, this is what, in a nutshell, the letter said when she invited folks to join the table. The charge of the task force would be, first of all, to develop the proposed policy and procedures and then bring those to the administration for pr approval, to also identify issues relevant to the implementation of the policy and to resolve those issues. So essentially to come up with an action plan for how to get this done and then to fully implement the policy by the fall of 2012. These are uh, the departments that were represented on our implementation committee. Uh, there was a lot of thought put into who, who should be at the table on this one. Um, you'll, you might notice that um, this, this looks a bit different than what most folks' tobacco-free task forces look like. Um, sometimes you pull people from your original advocacy task force and put them on the implementation team. Sometimes you don't. Um, in this case, the three 
uh, groups highlighted in green, um, those were the three co-chairs, and all three of those people were heavily involved in the advocacy efforts, but pretty much all of the other um, departments and folks at the table were, uh, were new. They were basically, you know, this policy is now going to happen, and we're done debating it. Now you figure out how to make it happen. So um, I just wanted to point out that uh, the Healthy Campus Initiative Director, her name was Marcy Torres. Um, she was one of the co-chairs as was Paula State, who speaks frequently on um, this topic at national conferences. She's the Director of Health Promotion and Education at the Student Health Center. And then I was with Lane County Public Health, so I was the, the sole person that was not a university employee that was appointed to the committee. Um, we were very planful, and everybody that we had at the table, um, you can probably just reading through this, you know, in your own minds go, oh, I know why that person is at the table. But of course you want student housing there, um, because you have all these dorm rooms and some smoking occurring there, we needed to problem solve that. Government and community relations, we wanted to make sure that when the policy went into effect and people moved off campus to use tobacco, that wasn't negatively impacting neighbors and businesses. Um, the admissions department, you of course want people knowing way ahead of time before they come to your university that this is a policy. Um, we had the computer folks at the table. Of course, we had uh, the um, Department of Public Safety. Um, how is this going to be enforced? What would their role be? Um, campus planning and real estate might not be an obvious one, but this uh, woman who was on our committee was instrumental in helping us define the boundaries of the policy because the University of Oregon owns lots of other properties that aren't right near campus, um, properties even in Portland and out of the coast and in eastern Oregon. And so we had, she helped us know, you know, what, what places would be impacted and how to deal with that. Um, of course, we had a faculty representative and a student representative, um, obviously media relations because we wanted to do a good job of pushing this out um, over and over and over again. You definitely want an athletics person on your committee if you have a big um, sports facility on campus. We have a huge football stadium and baseball stadium that are um, they're on Oregon, University of Oregon owned property, but they're a little ways off of the main campus. Um, we had a representative from the Dean of Students who helped us with the student conduct code issues, somebody from Human Resources that helped us with the faculty and staff issues and how discipline was going to work with those folks and how to communicate messaging to them. We had a person from International Affairs because we had a really large, we have a pretty large um, student body population um, from other countries, and some of those folks have higher smoking rates. Um, and then campus operations; those are the people that you know make everything run, do all the um, the cleaning up and maintenance and everything of all the facilities. So these people knew exactly where all the ashtrays currently were and and where the hot spots on campus were and things of, like of that nature. Okay, so um, the subcommittee was huge. We had 20 people. It's too many people to have really in one, one meeting and be effective, so we broke into three different groups. Um, we had the policy development group, which later on worked on boundaries and signage. Um, we had the marketing and communications group who figured out the whole what's the message going to look like, um, how are we going to roll it out, where is it going to be placed. They also spent a significant amount of time working on um, cessation resources, promoting those, making sure we had them. Um, and then there was the enforcement committee. You know, who's going to enforce, who's going to pay those people, um, timeline for rollout, do we want to, you know, do a one-year education before we issue any citations or warnings. Um, and when you see a violation, how does that get reported, who's in charge of following up on that, so enforcement was a big deal. Um, many of the 18 or 19 or 20 folks on the implementation team served on multiple committees. So um, all of the co-chairs were going to pretty much all three of these committees. And these committees were meeting, I would say, at least probably twice a month because by the time we were all pulled together, we really only had a little over a year before the policy took effect. And so we were scrambling to get everything in place. So one of the questions that people often ask, or and one of the reasons that some, I think, some campuses are struggling with trying to get a policy passed is people are really worried about what is this going to cost? I mean, this is just going to be, you know, hundreds and thousands of dollars to um, push, put these policies through. 
And if there's really not a one-size-fits-all policy. <clears throat> there have been campuses that have been really successful and have not had to put a ton of money into this. Um, the U of O likes to kind of be flashy and go big, and so they found some ways to get some pretty good contributions that I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, but your real, you know, the things that are really, the main thing that's going to take most of your money is staff time. So those 20 people on that committee, you know, they're full-time paid staff people, and um, basically, I mean, they still had all of the parts of their regular job, but this had to be an, a position of elevation, and they needed to know that this is a part of your job for the next 13 months, and, you know, you need to be coming to these meetings. Um, marketing and education could be really big. You know, you could spend a lot of money on that. You don't have to in order to make things work. Um, dealing with the facilities issues, that's a pretty small drop in the bucket um, issue, as well as signage. Um, tobacco cessation programming and pharmacology, again, you know, you should have some of that in place. Um, pretty much every state has a free uh, tobacco quit line. Many states, um, you know, most, well, actually, cessation is now mandated through the Affordable Care Act. So. There are resources out there. When we were doing this, those things were not in place yet, um, and we worked really hard to make sure that, that uh, anybody who wanted to quit was going to get free help. Um, enforcement does have a price, but uh, it is probably a lot smaller than most people think. And next slide. Um, so one implementation tip I would just pass on is that um, you, of course, when you're setting up these committees or, you know, when you're looking for funders of these efforts, um, I, it's pretty obvious that you want to look for your traditional partners like the Cancer Society, the Lung Association, Heart Association. Um, none of those folks were on our implementation team, but they were kind of in the periphery, and I knew that if something, if I needed something to happen, for instance, I called the Lung Association when I knew the president was going to make the announcement, and I said, hey, is there any way somebody could drive down from Portland and be at the big announcement and say a few really nice things about how wonderful it is that U of O is doing this? And so they, of course, rearranged their schedule, and they were down there and, and did a nice little speech, and it was on TV and everything. So, you know, making sure to keep those partners involved. Um, <clears throat> I was from the local public health authority and had been working in tobacco control for many, many years, and this was actually a part of my work plan was to work with the University of Oregon. Um, so making sure that you've got local public health at the table is really important. Sorry, little drink of water there. <laughs> um, but consider your non-traditional partners. We ended up getting really, really good support from one of our local health insurance companies by the name of Pacific Source Health Plans. Um, the timing was just right in where they were getting ready to do a pretty big donation to um, not only the University of Oregon, but also Oregon State University for a five-year healthy campus initiative. Um, and uh, the goals of that grant were much broader than to, uh, fixing the tobacco problem, but that was one of the primary things they wanted to have worked on. So there was a full-time full paid staff person paid for by that grant um, that helped make this uh, policy take effect. Um, we got some support from Nike, which is probably obviously pretty unique to the University of Oregon, and that work started uh, probably soon after the president made his announcement. Um, Paula at the Student Health Center started working some magic and talking to different higher up people in the university, you know, saying we need some help to pay for this policy. And um, I believe it was the University Foundation contacted Nike, and, you know, they're a health company. Do you want to, you know, help sponsor this effort? And actually, the Nike World Campus in Beaverton, Oregon, is tobacco-free, so they were able to talk a little bit about that. And um, they ended up um, doing some in-kind messaging development that I'm going to show you here in a couple seconds. Um, and they actually did it with some student interns as well, so that was kind of neat. The The young people got to be in... Um, they were in, I think, design school or something, and they were interning up at the Nike campus, and they were able to work with some professionals and come up with some interesting um, marketing ads. Um, this 
real quickly, our timeline, and there's a little, first of all, typo. It was November 2010 when the president made the announcement, so just giving you a quick picture here of what, what a rollout looks like. Um, fall 2010, he announced. Implementation committee came together finally in June of 2011. <clears throat> we found out probably mid-summer that Nike was going to help us with the messaging. And in August 2011, they presented us with all of their ideas, and then we had only like six to eight weeks to vet those ideas and start making them into T-shirts and posters and different things. Um, so the, the initial uh, education campaign started in the fall of 2011, a whole year before the policy took effect. And um, the first big thing we did was give away thousands of T-shirts um, to the student section of one of the major football games. And, I'll show you the T-shirt here in a minute, but um, it was promoting the tobacco-free campus in kind of a um, not super overt way. Um, January 2012, then, with New Year's resolutions, the promotion and education turned to um, cessation, letting people know we're here, we're going to help you get through this, and if you're ready to quit, you know, there's resources. Um, <clears throat> it was all the way in the spring of 2012 when the policy, although we had the policy pretty well written by the end of summer um, <clears throat> 2011, it took several months to work through administration, work through legal counsel, and then finally in May 2012, um, it was posted for a public hearing at the state level, and, and that was a pretty short window. And so in June, um, we were notified, okay, the policy is real now, and we were like, well, that's a good thing it's real because we have three months <laughs> until it's implemented. Um, <clears throat> June 2012, we were still working on a signage plan. Um, that was one area that was more difficult than what I thought it would be. Um, there, UGO actually has a permanent sign committee that has to review any request for any kind of signage that's going to be placed anywhere on campus. Um, not so much sandwich boards and stuff that you can remove uh, at the end of the day, but anything metal that's going to be up there forever. And, it's part of their beautification policy. They don't want you know anybody to put any old sign up anywhere and have the campus look cluttered. But um, we ended up only being allowed to post, I think it was like thir a total of 13 to 16 larger signs. Um, and the campus is really big. So um, that, that was a problem. And, we, and um, Paula and Marcy went back and got permission to put more signs up later. But, that took a little bit of time, so um, just word to the wise, think about your signage early and see if you can solve that one. Um, and then the policy was uh, implemented September 2012. Um, here's just briefly a few of our uh, promotional materials. This was early in the campaign before we had the Nike money, but we wanted to start communicating this is going to happen, so there were posters and different things done. And this is Nike's, <laughs> this was Nike's, uh, <clears throat> creative um, messaging, and I should just share that it was so fun when they presented this to us in this fancy boardroom on campus. I felt like I was in an episode of Mad Men or something, but they had their boards and they were flipping through all these different interesting ideas, and I, I should, I've got all these things saved. There were some really, really cool things and some kind of flops in my opinion as well, but this one when they placed it up there, I mean, I'm in my mid-40s. I didn't know what this meant. And the younger people were all snickering. And um, I, I won't say what it means, but because probably most of the people on the phone do know what it means. Um, but to us, it really meant smoke and tobacco-free university. <clears throat> but it was in a catchy way that if you were wearing a T-shirt or a poster and you were a student walking on campus and you didn't know about the policy, and you saw that, you might say, what, and take a closer look. And so that was the whole idea behind that um, marketing strategy was how do we get through the clutter of all the other things people see and hear and all the flashy things so that they'll even absorb the fact that this policy is about to happen. Here's some of our uh, marketing things, the green T-shirt was what we handed out at that uh, football game. And you'll see that the STFU is on the back of the neck so that it wasn't quite as offensive, but so that um, people would see it if you're walking in front of them. Um, we had stickers on the sides of the ash cans that were basically uh, you know, warning people, this, this contraption is going away in nine months, that kind of a thing. 
Um, this was a countdown clock that we bought and put into the middle of the student union um, that can be changed out over time for other issues. The health center purchased this, and there was a, a ticker on it that was counting down the days, minutes, hours until we were completely tobacco-free. Um, examples of cessation efforts in January of 2012, of course, including different languages, making sure we were outreaching to everybody. This is a photo of our then student body president and our then um, University of Oregon president doing some little PR things together about um, how happy everyone was that this policy was about to take effect. So um, considerations for marketing and communicating the policy, um, we had pretty significant backlash from the Human Resources Department about the STFU campaign. And although we had human resources on our implementation committee, um, you know, not all of the different, the three different committees, uh, it was so fast paced that all the information probably wasn't shared as well as it could have been but between the different committees and then you have somebody take a vacation or somebody absent for some reason and, um, you know, they find out kind of late in the game that this is, this is what the marketing campaign is going to be. And um, <clears throat> they weren't happy about it primarily because they were hearing from a small number of faculty and staff that it was really disrespectful um, to smokers. Um, they were not really getting complaints from the student body. I'd say most of the students thought it was pretty cool and there were posters up in dorm rooms and all that kind of stuff. But um, it did set us back a little bit and we weren't really allowed to use it in a big way um, throughout the rest of the, the implementation period um, once um, HR let us know that it was, you know, it was a problem from their perspective. Um, <clears throat> you definitely want to think about the length of time that you need to get the message out. You know, you have to repeat things over and over and over and over again, and still people might not know what's happening. Um, how the message is perceived would have been a good idea to probably vet that with some people, although I have to say there were lots of faculty and staff that thought it was really great, too. Um, that's the social norming, questions that arise with marketing. It was hard for us to start marketing when we didn't have a clear um, uh, understanding of what the boundaries of the campus would be, and we didn't actually have the policy approved until May of 2012. So we started with simpler messaging, and then as it got closer, we made sure we had to have those maps made so that people would know what was covered and things like that. Um, if you have city streets running through your campus, that will be a problem. It's a problem with every campus that I'm aware of where the, the university typically cannot enforce on the public roads or right-of-ways and people figure that out and then it can become a smoking gauntlet and it's a problem. Um, the University of Oregon has, you know, kind of gone with a, a tactic of trying to say, well, you know, in order to be polite to people, even though you could legitimately smoke out on that public sidewalk, is it really fair to make people have to walk through, you know, 25 smokers all lined up? So it, um, it's something that probably still could use a little bit of work, and, and we could potentially go to the city of Eugene and ask them to allow us to enforce in that area. Um, yeah, university-owned and controlled properties. Also, you know, if you you have buildings here, there, and everywhere, how is it going to be enforced there? Um, let's see. I should be wrapping things up here pretty quick. Uh, enforcement. So uh, what we ended up doing was the policy took effect in fall 2012, and we didn't communicate loud and clear to everyone, hey, there are going to be no fines for a whole entire year, but we just worked really, really hard to be, you know, very positive, to give people warnings, to, um, you know, let people know that this is a process and it's going to take a little while before people get used to this. So there was ongoing education and warnings. Um, in the uh, policy there is, however, uh, the ability for the university to fine um, through the student conduct code process, um, fine the stu uh, violating student uh, a $30 fee and they have to report to some kind of appeal hearing and you know plead their case and things. So that is an option available. <coughs> I know, I believe there have been a few people that have gone through the conduct code process. I am not certain that anybody has actually been issued that $30 fee. Um, faculty and staff, 
cannot be fined, but they can be disciplined for, through a normal uh, behavioral discipline procedures, just as if they were violating any other policy. They might get a letter in their file and a warning, and, and you know, if they really, really uh, flouted the policy, you know, eventually they probably could be let go if, if they were refusing to comply. Um, visitors, vendors, contractors, other folks on campus, um, we, the U of O does have the ability um, through the Department of Public Safety to issue a $30 fine, but most people on campus um, are, uh, if they're doing the behavior, they usually are unaware of the policy and they usually, when they get confronted, they're like, oh, I'm really sorry. And I've been um, amazed at public events and things that I've attended on campus that um, outside of big, you know, big sporting arenas and different things, and I look for cigarette butts, and I mean, there's like nothing, like even after concerts and stuff. So, um, and there is some better signage in some of those venues, but it, it's not been a problem, I would say, with the visitors, vendors, and contractors. Um, let's see, fining. Yeah, we had a discussion around, you know, if you have like building trades people doing stuff on campus, you know, can they be fined? And um, when you have special events, how is that going to work? Um, other things people worried about was how long the appeals process will take for any of these tickets. Again, I don't believe the U of O has really issued tickets yet. If they have, it's been few and far between. Um, there was a worry initially, well, we can't have our public safety people all caught up in having to um, do this, you know, full time, and really they're not having to intervene hardly at all. Um, worries about consistency with supervisors. Some supervisors really, really do make their uh, folks comply, and others kind of turn and look the other way, and, um, you know, obviously that's, that's not okay. It's not fair to anybody, really. Um, there was discussion around fairness between faculty, staff, and students. You know, you can find some of them, you can't find others. If you're a tenured, tenured faculty person and you're a problem, it's, you know, really hard to, have, to do anything with those people. But these were all, I would say, worried about a lot more than, than probably they needed to be in actuality. Um, let's see. Oh, some worries about what happens if you approach someone and nicely ask them to put their cigarette out and then they get really confrontational with you and a fight starts or whatever. And to my knowledge, that has not happened. Um, and of course, if somebody looks like they're going to be really difficult to deal with, we actually wouldn't encourage people to approach them. We would, you know, ask them to get in touch with um, public safety. Um, talked about the city streets thing, littering in the neighborhoods, that is an ongoing problem and that's what I kind of wanted to end on with here is that um, litter is probably going to be a problem no matter what campus we're talking about, um, although litter reduction is huge. I mean, I would say that there are, you know, 80% of the tobacco litter is now gone. There are a few hot spots, and of course the hot spots are more on the edges of campus, and um, we have a, a pioneer cemetery that abuts next to one of the areas of campus, and people will go into the cemetery and smoke and throw butts on the ground. And um, one thing that we did was we invited any of these private businesses to have a tobacco-free policy themselves and to go ahead and put up a sign, and, and we let them know that we would help, you know, enforce that when we saw problems there. And, and I believe this, the Pioneer Cemetery did, did end up doing that, and I think that took down some of the litter problem. Um, signage is so important. Uh, it's really hard to have people enforce a policy by way of, you know, saying, hey, you're not supposed to smoke here. See the sign over there. And if there's not a single sign they can point to, they're not going to be brave enough to go up and ask somebody to put out a cigarette in most cases. So, um, you know, you, you can't litter the campus with signs and have it be obnoxious, but you do need some signage and probably in the early days um, supplementing with a lot of temporary signage, banners and sandwich boards and things like that um, helps. Um, there should be some kind of a campaign, I, I think, around um, sort of sort of guilting people into doing the right thing, some big kind of environmental push about how, how bad it is for cigarette butts to be littered all over the ground and take some five years to biodegrade and all of that kind of stuff. I, we kind of ran out of steam and didn't do as big of a thing as we could have 
um, on that. And that would be the campaign, if I was there, that I would want to be running now um, because now the problem is these little hot spots. And so, um, you know, putting signs where you see the butts and then making people feel embarrassed about it. <laughs> um, smoking on campus has significantly decreased since the policy. This was a online survey that was fielded. Uh, the green bars, originally the, the, a psychology professor designed this and fielded it in the spring of 2012, so pre-policy implementation. And these are folks that self-identified as a current tobacco user. And at that point, 64 of the self-identified student tobacco users said they were smoking somewhere on campus at some point during their day. 69% of the faculty and staff who use tobacco indicated the same thing, that they were currently an on-campus on tobacco user. And then a year later, you know, pretty much exactly a year later, after the policy had been in place for about eight or nine months, um, the, same field was, uh, the same survey was fielded, and you can see there was a pretty significant reduction in the number of people who were continuing that behavior on campus. Um, it's not perfect, uh, but it's really a huge reduction. And anecdotally, um, the health center is hearing from lots of people that this policy is partially one of the reasons, or in some cases, the reason that they were finally able to quit tobacco. Uh, lessons learned: uh, Understand that there's a you know there's a really big time commitment with this. When you're doing the advocacy work, it seems never ending and like it's going to be the hardest part of your work. And then you get that done, and then you have to do implementation, and then you get that done, and you still have these litter problems. So it, it is uh, you need a few at least a few really committed people that are in for the long haul on this. Um, ensure that you have a leadership support, and I'm not talking about just you know, the university president, but when you think about all the decisions that need to get made between when the policy passes and to implement it, um, if you don't have some pretty high-ranking people on your impl implementation team, it can really slow the process down. And I would think that all of the co-chairs, Paula and Marcy and I, would unanimously agree that looking back, uh, although we liked being co-chairs, we were all public health people, we agreed with each other on most things, um, it probably would have been beneficial if one of our positions had been filled by somebody who was a, a really high-level department head or something because um, things would have moved quick, more quickly that way. Um, yeah, so that's what the third bullet is there. Um, be careful about your messaging. Make sure you have lots of signs. Plan for your enforcement. Plan ahead for the litter problem. It will happen, and if you know what you're going to do about it, it'll be a lot better than you know having people complain about it for six months and then trying to take care of it. Um, and and maybe most importantly, pay attention to what other campuses have already learned through this process. I mean, there are hundreds. I guess Molly would say probably even over, there's over a thousand right tobacco-free campuses now in the U.S. and lots and lots of people that have. Uh, lots of lessons learned, so we don't we don't have to make the same mistakes over and over again. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of the rest of the presentations. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We're going to take it now to take a closer look at Clark College. Um, and joining us today is Jeff Miller. Jeff is the Environmental Health and Safety Manager at Clark College and is an advisor for the Tobacco-Free Campus Policy. He has been in the environmental health and safety field for more than 13 years, focusing specifically on behavior-based safety. So with that, I'll hand it over to Jeff. Go ahead and press star six to unmute your line, Jeff. Great. Thanks, Molly. Um, I am Jeff Miller from Clark College. Uh, I'll go relatively fast. I know we're running out of time. Uh, this is our policy. That's it. It's not a very lengthy policy. Uh, what we decided to do with ours is we addressed all tobacco. We didn't just address smoking tobacco. We also addressed chewing tobacco and e-cigarettes. So we don't allow any of it on our campus. Um, it's all banned inside of the borders. No chewing tobacco, no smoking tobacco. Uh, we addressed littering in the policies. You can see there. We defined it. Um, no sale of tobacco products. We don't allow advertisement, no giving out of any type of tobacco swag, no promotional activities, uh, no advertisement, and we also have uh, a fine associated with uh, tobacco use on campus. Uh, 
how we got there. Uh, it's a short policy. We didn't get there fast, though. Uh, we actually started in 2001 addressing it, our EHS committee. Uh, started hearing increasingly more complaints about tobacco smoke on campus, and they attempted to address it from their level through education and just trying to have smoking areas to try to separate the smokers from the non-smokers, uh, I guess things that everybody else had already tried to do. Of course, none of those efforts were successful. So in May of 2004, they conducted a campus survey and just some of those results, uh, you can see there we had 68% of non-smokers that responded there were concerned about secondhand smoke. And we had a pretty even split of people that wanted designated smoking areas and then those that wanted a smoke-free campus. So in fall of that year, a subcommittee was formed and they drafted two different policies, one for a smoke-free campus and then one for a designated smoking area policy. And in winter of that year, uh, we held forums to discuss these two policies. And 65% of the attendees for those forums wanted to go with the fact that go with a tobacco-free campus. They didn't want to go with, with designated smoking areas. So that subcommittee asked the college council to make that policy recommendation to our executive cabinet. Uh, they, however, uh, the council decided that they wanted to get more, uh, get more feedback from the students. They didn't think they had enough information back from the students. So another email survey was sent out to the students, and 65% of the students supported a tobacco tobacco-free campus policy. So in spring of 2005, College Council reviewed all of the survey findings and they voted unanimous, unanimously to have a tobacco-free campus. They sent that up to Executive Cabinet. They reviewed the recommendations. They also re uh, voted unanimously that we would be a tobacco-free campus. And uh, in fall of 2006, we got with the unions to ask for their input letting them know that we were going to be tobacco free. In October and November of 2006, our board of trustees voted on it, decided we would be tobacco free, and we have been tobacco free since April of 2006. Uh, sounds easy. Uh, however, how do you maintain it? So we have high turnover. We're a community college, so every two years you can figure we get new students here. Uh, we put information in enrollment packets. We have new student orientation uh, to make sure that we get that message out to the students. Signage throughout and surrounding the campus, we have smoke-free plastered all over the place. Uh, we have big reader boards. We have two big uh, electronic reader boards on two main streets surrounding the campus. And then in every one of our buildings, we have electronic message kiosks. Basically, they're just big flat screen TVs that scroll messages on them. Uh, that flashes messages up about smoke-free probably every 30 to 40 seconds. We put it up there pretty regularly. And then our VP of Administrative Services, who is in charge of our tobacco-free campus policy, he sends out a quarterly email to our students. That's the flyer that we put in the enrollment packets. Uh, unfortunately, it is in desperate need of updating. Uh, as you can see, it still says it's a new policy. Uh, it just has on there uh, what the policy is. Uh, it also talks about littering and that uh, violators will be fined, $20 fine. It has some helpful phone numbers if the students want more information about the policy. And then on the back, back side of the flyer, it just goes over how we got to our policy, it goes over all the steps. Again, has the contact information on the bottom of it if the students would like more information. And then our lessons learned, these were just our biggest lessons learned. There, there were a bunch of things we learned. Uh, these were our biggest things. Partner with your city agencies. Um, we learned real quick that we didn't control anything once we got to the city sidewalks. Um, our smokers congregate at the city sidewalks, and in particular at the bus shelters. When it's pouring down rain, they love to get in the bus shelters. We can't control that, unfortunately. A lot of complaints uh, come about from that. And so all I can say is partner with the city, city police in particular, to see what can be done about, about controlling the congregation in those areas because you're not going to be able to control that. 
uh, but you're going to get a lot of complaints about it. Use your enforcement. Uh, we do not do the best in that, uh, and, but we're lucky too. We don't have to. We don't have a big problem with uh, with smokers. Every now and then, I'd say probably every I don't know a couple of years, we'll have a mass protest, and I'm using finger quotes, where they'll do a stroll through campus and, and want to show that they can smoke. But um, if you're going to have an enforcement arm you might want to think about using it because you're going to have those that are going to want to challenge your policy. And uh, continue to look for improvements and use multiple viewpoints. Don't forget to use your smokers. that They're already feeling targeted. So use them when you're looking to make improvements in your policies. They're going to have some good ideas about how to remain smoke-free uh, and tobacco-free. Uh, involve all of your shareholders in this and keep your, keep your policy uh, new and, and alive. Don't just let it set. Uh, ours has been there since 2006. As you can see from our flyer that we put in our in our enrollment packets, it, it, it needs to be kept alive. Uh, ours, ours is becoming kind of dull. Uh, I just noticed that when I was putting this together that, that it just needs to be improved a little bit. And that is it for me. Fast enough for you? That's perfect. Thanks, Jeff. And now I will hand it over to Allison Maroney. Allison is a lung health manager in Western Washington for the American Lung Association of the Mountain Pacific. She works with medical personnel, school representatives, and community organizations to provide education on lung health topics ranging from COPD and lung cancer to tobacco prevention and cessation. Whether by presenting this education directly or providing other health educators with the evidence-based, medically accurate materials of the American Lung Association, her goal is for this crucial information to reach as many Washingtonians as possible. She holds a BS in journalism from Northwestern University and an MA in health education from Columbia University and is a certified health education specialist. Allison? Hi, I'm here. Can you hear me? Sure can. Awesome. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me on as a presenter today. Um, I am a lung health manager at the American Lung Association of the Mountain Pacific. As Molly mentioned, uh, we're actually a seven-state region. I do our work in Western Washington. I see some of my colleagues are on this call, which is great, so hello. Um, I always like to start by reminding people of something really important, and that's that everyone knows that smoking is bad for them, but not everyone wants to quit. We found that about 70% of smokers do want to quit, and the other 30% simply can't be forced. Quitting has to be driven from within. So keep that in mind as I go through all these resources. The following tips are really beneficial for people who do want to quit, and there really are some fabulous resources out there. So at the Lung Association, we've researched what makes a cessation program work, and we found that the ideal smoking cessation program really plans ahead, uh, focuses on goals, gets your plan in line uh, so you can feel confident about a strategy, or get a prescription if that's the route you're going to take. You want to be able to look forward to your quit date, and having lead time will really help with that. Um, a good program focuses on social support, encourages you to tell others. A lot of people don't want to talk about quitting smoking. They're worried that they're going to fail and slip, and then others will judge them for it or not be confident that they can do it in the future, but it's actually so important to seek out that social support. A good cessation program combines multiple elements. Um, whether through group or one-on-one -on -one support, using nicotine replacement therapy, using prescription medication, the buddy system, really whatever works for different learning styles. And a good cessation program is proactive about the bad stuff. When you quit smoking, your life is going to change. So a good program helps you psychologically prepare for those changes that come with essentially switching your identity to that of a non-smoker. And also a good cessation program is never too far away. You want reinforcement to be in your pocket. You want to be able to access it quickly when you need to, online or on an app, or just a call away. So of course, a plug for the American Lung Association's Freedom From Smoking program. Um, our program works because you can access it in multiple ways, in person, over the phone, or online. So it fits your schedule and your preferred learning methods. Some people like interacting in person. Some people are more private and want to do it online on their own time. 
Um, the program touches on the biological, psychological, and social elements of addiction, helping you figure out why you're addicted, and getting to that step helps you break down those links. And as I said in the last slide, it's, it's going to proactively prepare you for those bumps in the road, becoming a non smoker So if your college isn't able to offer on-campus cessation, promoting some off-campus or online programs can really be effective. Um, so some options are your state quit line. Calling 1-800-QUIT-NOW is a great way to get connected to your state line and get some resources that way. Um, it's free. Uh, sometimes it can be patchy depending on state funding, but that is a good place to start. Um, of course, the Lung Association does have a phone line. It's called our Lung Helpline. It actually didn't make it onto the slide. It was pretty cramped, um, but it's 1-800-LUNG-USA, and I can give that information to anyone who wants it. Um, it's for all lung health questions, but there are smoking cessation counselors on staff who can reach you quickly and help you work on a quit plan or stay quit if you're having kind of a moment of questioning. Also, there's local quit support programs that you can find through your local health department, social service agencies, um, the YMCA or the hospital. So it's good to call your local tobacco partner and figure out um, what is there to offer to the students on campus. And then, of course, there's online support, which is fantastic. Um, in this technological age, it's a great time to be trying to quit online. So smokefree.gov is a great place to start. Um, becomeanx.org is great. It's really interactive. The Lung Association also has two great websites. We have the quitteringyou.org, which is really informative, um, great for people who want to quit or people who want to help a loved one quit. And then freedomfromsmokingonline.org, which I did mention on the past slide. Um, and then websites like mylastdiff.com, which are great for people who use uh, chewing tobacco. Because it's not always all about smoking. And finally, a word on e-cigarettes, because you know we can't talk enough about e-cigarettes these days. So some people think that they're a miracle quit aid because there's no tobacco involved. But at the Lung Association, we just can't get behind them yet for a few reasons. Um, First, it still keeps you addicted to nicotine and reinforcing that kind of hand-to-mouth oral habit of smoking. Um, and really importantly, we need more research on what's in the vapor. We still, at this point, don't know everything you're inhaling and exhaling is secondhand vapor when you vape. And we need more regulation and testing and consistency among the more than 200 different brands of e-cigarettes in our country. So that was a very, very quick summary. Great, thank you so much, Allison. I want to thank uh, all of our presenters for taking the time to share their expertise and knowledge with us with us today. I think we've heard some, some very valuable lessons learned, and as you can see, the path to policy and implementation can be different from campus to campus, but we can learn um, from the campuses that have already paved the way. I do want to remind all of our participants that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our Fresh Air Campus webpage in a few days as well as well the uh, copies of these uh, slides. So with that, I will open it up for questions. If any of you have questions, please feel free to use the chat box on the left, lower left-hand corner of your um, screen. And we've got a number of questions already, and I see we have seven minutes being mindful of time, so we'll try to get through as many of these as we can, and anything we cannot answer, I'll make sure to follow up with our presenters and send out some responses via email after, um, after this webinar. So the first question, and I'll try to sort of clump these into themes. There was a few questions that came in regarding exemptions and policy, and I believe these were directed to Stephanie at the University of Oregon. Um, Stephanie, do you can you speak to what exemptions, if there were any exemptions in the U of O policy specific to sacred ceremonial tobacco use, anything regarding tailgating, and if you allowed um, smoking in cars? Um, can you hear me, Molly? Yes. Okay, uh, uh, so in a nutshell, the policy was uh, very comprehensive. It does cover e-cigarettes. Um, under the policy, there should be no tobacco use in tailgating. However, that doesn't mean that it's not happening. Um, we have huge parking lots and people come in in their RVs and uh, you can't you know, always know what's happening. I believe there's very little enforcement out in the parking lots at the sporting events. I think that the U of O has chosen to really um, put their enforcement 
uh, you know, muscle behind the the actual venue itself where more people are getting exposed and where there's, you know, more uh, more DPS people that are able to assist. Um, with regard to the sacred tobacco use, the state of Oregon um, actually has in our smoke-free workplace law an exemption for um, sacred tobacco use, um, but it cannot be of commercial tobacco products. So uh, there is a Native American longhouse on the UVO campus, and if they were to be using tobacco in a truly sacred way, that would be allowed, um, but that wouldn't include smoking Marlboro cigarettes. Um, and the policy did have, if I'm remembering correctly, a allowance for, I think it was the president, to consider exemptions if people brought them, like for special, you know, special occasions if people brought them forward. But to my knowledge, nobody's ever requested an exemption for anything. Um, the private cars issue we originally had in the policy, and that was actually taken out by the legal counsel who said he had um, read through some other uh, cases that had been um, problems in Oregon and that private cars was an issue that he, you know, although it might have been able to be put in there and not had a lot of objections, he, he did not feel confident that we could uphold that, so he, he did take that out of the policy. But I'm not sure that people understand, for the most part, that that's not in there. So. Terrific. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and I'm not sure how much you can speak to the um, cessation programming and the, and the pharmacotherapy that was offered at the University of Oregon, uh, but a question came in regarding if there was any issues with the health nurse dispensing free NRT lozenges or gum. Um, so the student cessation program was run through the, stu the, through the health center, and they actually were primarily prescribing patches. So they did have to meet with a medical professional and be evaluated, and they actually had to come in, I think it was monthly, or maybe it was every six weeks, to uh, basically re-up if they needed continuation of patches. And to my knowledge, there were no issues with that. Um, we had peer health educators, students that were involved in the screening process and um, helping students out through that as well, and, and uh, no, it was, it was totally fine. We, we did, um, I wanted to say, we did get a, uh, a pocket of money from student government. They had some discretionary funds at the end of the year, and they decided, they took a vote, you know, let's put some of this discretionary money towards even funding more cessation aids for the student body population. So that was, I think, a really positive thing. Great, thank you. And I'm scrolling through our questions, and it looks like we've got them answered. If anyone else has any other burning questions or you feel like you um, need some more clarification, go ahead and send a quick message through the chat box. Um, otherwise, we will go ahead and uh, close it out just a couple minutes early. So thank you everyone again for joining us and I will be sending the link to this recording and um, any follow-up questions uh, and answers out to your email addresses um, in early next week. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.